Multiple casualties have been confirmed in Syria's eastern Ghouta after terrorists shelled a large group of civilians who were trying to flee the besieged enclave. That's according to Russia's defence ministry. It says that nearly 300 families were in the convoy. Both Russian and international journalists are also believed to have been targeted by shelling. Artis Moran Gazdiev looks into the story. According to the Russian military, the 300 families had allegedly gathered together to leave eastern Ghouta. Crossing the front lines is always dangerous, so it's best done when there's a safe window with the agreement of both belligerents. The Syrian government was waiting for them. The rebels doubtlessly knew what was going on and shelled them. They reportedly shelled the procession of civilians a mere kilometer before they were out of East Ghouta. And then, to top it all off, they shelled the relatives and journalists waiting on the Syrian side at the end of the corridor. Nothing's changed. They aren't allowing civilians to leave, just like their Islam Islamist brethren did in Aleppo. Yet, hearing Washington tell it, they don't mention that. They think it's joke-like. Russia has called for these joke-like humanitarian corridors. Russia needs to just do what the United Nations had agreed to and voted on, and that is a countrywide ceasefire. Fleeing civilians would mean less human shields. It would be a PR blow. People don't want to stay with rebels. They'll talk, say all sorts of horrible things about life under jihadists. They'll challenge the narrative. Why let them leave? Too many problems. Take also rebel shelling of Damascus. Blind, aimless, shells pepper Damascus daily for years now. So many dead and still dying, still to die. Yet you won't see any hysteria about that. In fact, you won't hear much at all. They won't admit that rebels are keeping people hostage because that justifies Assad's operation, as do those that die in rebel shelling. So why mention it? It ruins the narrative. It's so much simpler when it's all black and white. And that's just hours after a humanitarian convoy was temporarily prevented from entering eastern Ghouta due to military developments on the ground. On Monday, shelling forced another convoy to turn around and to leave the enclave. The situation in the area remains dire. To discuss the latest, I'm joined now by Joshua Landis, who's director at the Centre of Middle East Studies at the University of Oklahoma. Uh, great to speak to you as always, uh, Joshua. And I want to pick up on what we've said about the humanitarian corridors, because that we've played uh, this evening a clip from uh, an official from the State Department who referred to them as being a joke. It seemed that the US didn't think that Russia was genuinely setting up corridors for, uh, for civilians to escape via. But we've seen here 300 families tried to use these corridors um, and were attacked. Do you think Washington will now change its approach, its rhetoric as a result of that? Uh, no, I don't. I think um, the larger situation is very dire. Washington clearly is, um, is wants a, a ceasefire and has called for um, a deconfliction zone in this area. It doesn't want to see any fighting. It's not interested in having Assad spread his control over more of Syria, which of course means Iranian power. And the United States is um, interested in rolling back Iranian power, as well as Russian power. Presumably, though, we're going to see the Syrian government forces 
continue to put the pressure on the militants. Moscow's calling for the, the militants and some would say the terrorists after the, the, the attacks that we've seen on civilians to get out of eastern Ghouta. Do you think they will leave or are they going to fight to the death? Well, it seems like they're fighting to, to the bitter end. And I think a number of military commanders in the Ghouta have said once the Ghouta falls, the rebellion is really over. And I think that there is, there is a, a sense of the necessity of really digging their heels here. And they do seem to believe that the international community may come and uh, respond to their calls for help, although that seems very unlikely. It, 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 does, it, it, is, it, it does seem strange that there isn't a truce, that there isn't some kind of dialogue for um, you know, an end to this hostilities, because it's quite clear that the Syrian government is going to drive forward. It's not going to accept a rebel enclave in the suburbs of Damascus that will survive on to, into the distant future. So this seems to be the end game, and it's killing a lot of civilians. There's no doubt about it. If the militants do see that the writing is on the wall for them and then admit that they have no chance of victory and decide to leave, they put their hands up, uh, what would the reaction be from, from the international community, do you think? You know, um, there, there are many supporters of the Syrian rebels who I think will be very disappointed. There are others, I think, who will sigh a great sigh of relief because the Syrian war has become so devastating. And we saw this in the cities that the United States bombed, whether it was in Mosul or Raqqa, uh, Ramadi, and many others, where, where rebel forces and ISIS in particular really dug in and fought till the last house was devastated. And, and that's happened, of course, in many parts of Syria as well in the face of Syrian government onslaughts in Aleppo, and now we're seeing it here in the Ghouta. And it, it just doesn't seem to be an end. There is, a, there it is one town after the next that's leaving a real path of devastation. And after this, it's quite clear that the Syrian army is going to turn to both Dera, near the Jordanian border, and up in Idlib, near the Turkish border. And there's going to be some, some very fierce fighting there as well, I think. By all accounts, the, the, the terrorists who are in East, camped in eastern Ghouta have been firing uh, projectiles, rockets into Damascus, killing civilians in government-controlled territory. There's been little to no reporting of this in, uh, in the mass media. Why is that? I mean, there are two sides, obviously, to the conflict and to the story. Why is it not being covered? Well, I think a lot of people would like to see Assad lose. And, and... And therefore, and they're really taking the side of the rebels. There's no doubt about it. Uh, whether it, most of the United States press is clearly on the side of the rebels. They believe that Assad is an evil person who is running an evil regime and they'd like to see it fall. And, and therefore, stories about the suffering of Syrians in Damascus because of rebel bombardment uh, don't make much of an impression. And it, occasionally they get through in the stories, but they're, they're not... Um, they're not the overriding story, which is that this is uh, a brutal regime that refuses to make compromise. And, and that's, that's the story. And, um, and it's leading to a very lopsided narrative, as your, your introduction said, on the one side and on the other side. I mean, both sides are driving forward. And unfortunately, the Syrian people are trapped in the middle. Joshua, thanks very much for your time. Always great to get your insights. Joshua Landis, my guest, director at the Center of Middle East Studies at the University of Oklahoma.